Hey everyone and happy Easter. I do hope that you're all having a very fun and safe Easter Sunday. I did, since it is Easter, I wanted to talk about something a little bit more Christ-centered and that is the topic of why did Jesus die? Um, in this video, I'm not going to try to prove it from a historical context, meaning I'm not going to try to prove that Jesus was a historical person who did die under Pontius Pilate and rose again three days later. I'm also not going to be trying to talk about the philosophical context of is it philosophically right that one man dies for the sins of others. Uh, if you are interested in topics like that, I'll put videos in the description box below. However, in this video, I want to talk a little bit more about the scriptural basis for why Jesus died for us. Why did we need a Savior, and how does his salvation actually work? And I'm going to kind of break it down using the idea or the concept of sin. Now, sin is kind of one of those weird words that we don't really like in English. It usually conveys the idea of something that is not good, it's not right, it's kind of naughty, but at the same time, it's really delectable. It's actually really uh, desirable, but God said no, so therefore we can't do it. That's why we call things like Sin City, Las Vegas, Sin City. Uh, we're not trying to convey that Las Vegas is some sort of a dangerous place or an evil place. We're trying to convey that it's actually a really fun place, but you really shouldn't talk about it because, you know, it's not very good, but it, it, it really is, you know, and that's kind of how we look at the word sin. In the Bible, though, the word sin is broken down into three basic categories, and there's actually multiple words in the Hebrew and the Greek to, this, to define sin. But in English, it's translated in three different ways to convey three main definitions for what sin really is. The first word of sin is the idea of missing the mark. It's the idea that there is some sort of a standard out there that we haven't lived up to. So this would be the idea of a judicial context of there's a law out there, we violated the law. It's also kind of more of a natural con context of there, God has a nature and we aren't living in the nature of God. So for instance, God is love and therefore he desires for us to love our neighbor and to love him above all else. We don't do that both in our actions and in our hearts, so therefore we've sinned, we've missed the mark of God's perfection, and therefore we are at odds with the standard. And by the way, that's where guilt comes from. When you feel guilty, it's because you've violated some sort of a standard or a desire that you've had. You haven't measured up, and so you feel guilty. Um, the second word is trespass. Trespass is a personal word. So it's not just I violated some ethereal standard out there, it's I have hurt you, I've injured you, I made a promise to you and I broke it, or I lied to you, or I affected you in some negative way. It's a personal word. Now, what that means is since God is not just a judge, he also considers himself to be our father. He created us, he formed us in his image and likeness, he loves us and cares for us. So when we violate his commands, it's not just like some impartial judge that's like, okay, well, you violated this law out there and I'm going to judge you according to it. It's more like you as parents, you'll understand this. It's more like when your kids blatantly disregard what you've asked them to do. Um, it, there's a personal aspect to it. You, you feel wrong. You feel violated. So because of that, God not only has to judge us for our sins, but he also is separated from us because of our sins, because of our trespasses against us. It's hurt our relationship with him. And the third word is iniquity. The word iniquity means to be bent. So this carries the idea that there's something wrong with our nature. And I think the best place that we see this in the Bible is in Romans chapter 7. In Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul talks about this bent nature that he has. That even though he wants to do the right thing, he finds in himself the inability to do it. So he wants to love his neighbor as himself. He wants to care for other people. But he finds himself, and the main sin that he points out is covetousness. That he finds himself constantly wanting things that aren't his. And therefore violating his neighbor's sanctity both in his heart and in his actions. Not only that, but Paul says that there are wrong things that he doesn't want to do, but he practices them. So, you know, he's, he's trying not to do these wrong things, but he's continuously doing them anyway. And if you haven't experienced this battle with yourself, you're far more holy than I am and far more holy than the Apostle Paul. But for most of us, we could look at that and be like, yeah, I noticed that. There's something wrong with my nature. There's something wrong with the fact that even though I want to do good things, I don't do them. And I don't want to do wrong things, but I'm doing them anyway. So what has Jesus done to deal with these three things? Let's take the first one. Let's take the idea of trespass. How does Jesus deal with our trespasses against him? Well, when you sin against somebody in a personal way, the only way for that to be made right 
is if that person, the offended party, decides to forgive you, agrees to overlook or to reconcile with you in spite of what you've done. You can never make up for violating someone's trust by simply doing better next time. That person still has to be open and willing to receive you and to forgive you. So Jesus, in merely coming in the likeness of man, shows us as man that he's invested with us. He loves us. He cares for us. He wants what's best for us. He's not some God who lives up in heaven and is like, hey, figure it out on your own. He came near to show us that he is willing to forgive our trespasses against him. The next thing that he had to deal with, though, is our sins. Because even though God is willing to forgive our sins, he is also God. He's fully just. He cannot compromise his nature of justice. And it's kind of like this. Even with the human law, we understand this perspective. If you were to violate the traffic laws today, if you were to speed, and the police officer pulls you over and says, hey, you know you violated the traffic laws, you sped, you can't look at that cop and say, well, I'm going to try better. I'm going to do better next time. I'm not going to speed ever again. You'd be like, it's great. That's what you need to do. That's what you should do. However, you still need to pay for what you did. And in the same way, because we violated God's commands, even though he's willing to forgive us, and even though he's willing to have reconciliation in a relationship with us, our sins still separate us from him. Um, he cannot merely overlook what we've done. And our good actions can never make up for what we've done. We have to pay. Now, since we can never pay, because the payment for our sins would be separation from God, Jesus came in the likeness of man. That's why he came as a man. And he took our nature on himself, and he suffered what we should have suffered. And that is separation from God. It's no mistake that on the cross, Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus, even though he was the only one that earned a relationship with God, he's the only one that lived up to the standards of God, he suffered as a sinner. He suffered as if he was wicked and was separated from his father. The final one is iniquity. How did Jesus deal with our iniquity, our internal bentness against him and against his commandments? Well, in order to do this, Jesus, again, he took on our nature, but then he gave us his nature in the person of the Holy Spirit. So the author, C.S. Lewis, he called it the good infection. And I like that. Because when you get an infection, what it does is it spreads and it multiplies and it continues to grow inside of your body until it takes it over. Now, normally that's a bad thing, but imagine if you were infected with something good, something that spread and developed as fast or as efficiently as like a cancer, but instead of killing you, it was actually eradicating something evil in you and making you good, making you healthy. That's essentially what God has done. Because his son took on our nature and died on our behalf, it enables us to take on his nature and live with him. So he has imparted to us Holy Spirit, who is fully God, that indwells us, and the Holy Spirit is working out his nature in our nature. And that's why we feel this internal warfare even more pronounced as Christians, is even before we were Christians to begin with. Because now we feel that conflict. We feel one nature desiring to honor God and one nature desiring to dishonor God. And they're at odds with one another. Now, as we develop in our relationship with God, that nature becomes stronger and more powerful. But it was because Jesus took on our nature and it's because he gave us his nature that that all is possible. For without that, we would always be trapped and enslaved by our sins. Because even if you can teach someone to do the right thing, their nature is not dictated merely by their actions, it's dictated by their desires. In the book of Proverbs, it says, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. And if you can't do anything about your desires, your internal heart, then God hasn't changed anything. So it is only by the Spirit that mankind is changed, not merely reined in, but actually transformed to desire godliness and to desire God. And that's what makes serving God a joy for the Christian as opposed to an obligation. There's much more I can say on all three of those things, but I do hope that this video has helped. In my next video next week, stay tuned for it. I'm going to start talking about how to practically build relation with God, utilizing prayer primarily. But anyway, I hope you guys again have a great Easter and I'll talk to you later.